the entire reason that we're talking about drug crime in this class is it gives us a window into a much bigger question about the sorts of ways that a government can interfere with its citizens' lives and be morally justified in doing so. As I'll explain in a bit, the criminal law requires a special kind of moral justification which other forms of government interference may not. To see this, we need to know first a little bit about what actually makes something a crime. On the most general definition, and this is from the Model Penal Code, a crime is an act or omission prohibited by law for the protection of the public, the violation of which is prosecuted by the state in its own name and punishable by fine, comma, incarceration, comma, other restrictions upon liberty, or some combination of these. A crime is a very special kind of act, and the statutes, the laws which determine whether or not something's a crime, have a very specific format. Every crime is going to involve two components. First, it involves the actus reus. The statute is going to say that a person is not allowed to move their body in a certain way, or in some cases, a person is required to move their body in a certain way. But it's rarely enough that a person just simply move around in the right way. You also have to have what's called a mens re, or a culpable mental state. So for example, purposely, I'm sorry, for example, causing the death of another person is the actus reus of murder. In fact, causing the death of another person is a homicide. But homicide by itself is not illegal. To make homicide a crime, there has to be the right kind of mental state that goes along with it. So under the model penal code, there are basically four, sometimes five or a few more, but basically four kinds of culpable mental state. Purpose, knowledge, recklessness, negligence, and some others that we'll get to. To act with purpose just means that you have to intend what you are doing. To act with knowledge means you have to know what you are doing. The definition of a murder, then, is a homicide. It's a causing the death of another that is done with purpose and knowledge. So in other words, you have to know what you're doing is killing somebody, and you have to be trying to actually kill them. Recklessness is a different state of mind. Recklessness occurs when the person knows that she's creating a unreasonable risk of harm to others or of something bad happening, but still goes ahead and does it. So reckless driving, if you're going 120 miles an hour down the freeway in the rain, is going to be even if so when you're driving recklessly like that, you know that you're creating the chance of having a massive accident and killing someone. But you're not trying to kill anyone. In fact, you're trying to drive as safely as you can. So you're not, if you run into someone and you kill them, you're not murdering them because you're not trying to do it. And you probably don't even know that what you're doing is actually causing an accident. But that's a little more complicated. The point is that in that case, you're driving recklessly. You are disregarding a risk of harm, and therefore you're, you are culpable for the death that you caused. Anytime you recklessly cause a death, that is generally understood as manslaughter. Below recklessness, you have another kind of mental state, negligence, which is basically just that a person uh, a reasonable person, so a person who's kind of normal and thinking clearly and blah blah blah, would know that there's a substantial risk of harm. In other words, they would know that the activity is reckless. But 
the person who is negligent doesn't know that. So they fail to know something that they're supposed to know. And the other sorts of cases are relatively special. So acting with a wanton and depraved heart is a additional consideration that can make somebody a murderer, even if what they're doing is would otherwise be negligent or maybe reckless. So the paradigm example here is some kids throwing uh, blocks of concrete off of an overpass on a freeway. They don't intend to be killing anybody. They don't know that they're going to kill anybody. In fact, they might not even be thinking about the possibility that someone will die. But the act of throwing bricks off of an overpass onto a freeway is so callous and disregarding of the other people's lives that if somebody, if in that sort of case a person is killed, the prosecutors would charge them with murder under this special kind of mental state. Strict liability crimes are ones where actually you have no mental state um, or there is no required mental state. So for example, speeding tickets uh, have no requirement that you intended to speed or that you knew you were speeding or anything like that. It's just the actus reus. It's just the fact that you were moving your car along at a speed that is higher than it was supposed to be. That raises some questions about whether strict liability offenses are really crimes. And there's a bunch of interesting issues here, but we don't need to worry about them. What's now important is that in a at least philosophical way, the criminal law is the most coercive instrument that a state has available. It's If you go back a couple of slides to the earlier definition, crimes are necessarily punished. That is, they are necess they necessarily are met or they, they merit punishment, which is always taking away liberty. Punish you can't punish somebody by giving them more freedom. You punish somebody by taking away their freedom in one or another way. If you fine them, if you take some of their money or their property, you diminish their ability to do what they want to do because they have less money. Or if you put them in jail, obviously they cannot do all the sorts of things they would like to do because they are in a box. And in the extreme case, if you kill somebody, if you enact a death penalty upon them, a person is not at liberty to do anything because people, because the person who has been successfully executed can't do anything at all. That's kind of what death is. So now that we know what a crime is, and we know that it essentially involves taking away liberty, because it's essentially, the criminal law is essentially concerned with punishment, we can now talk about why that gives the criminal law a very special moral status. And the reason for that is that in a liberal democracy, there's some kind of presumption of liberty that comes out of the ideals of how this form of government was founded, or the ideals upon which we have sort of constructed our society and its laws and rules. So if you look at the political philosophy around the time that the United States was being founded, and arguably this occupies much of the political philosophy, the kinds of views of the purpose of a government to this day, although there are some new things that have popped up and are very important. But for our purposes, we're just trying to get the hang of why all this matters. So I'm going to focus on a really simplified version of a classic debate. On the one hand, you had theorists like Thomas Hobbes. And Hobbes thought that if people were left to their own devices, if they were put in a state of nature, as, as he calls it, they would basically run amok and kill each other. He says that the state of nature is a war of all against all. And 
he says that it's it would be such a terrible situation that any government strong enough to keep people from killing each other strong enough to monopolize force so that the government is the only entity able to force people to do stuff to kill people any government that could do that would be justified would be a legitimate government and because of that on this sort of Hobbesian view there's not a lot of room for us to judge whether or not a government's actions are justified or whether its laws are justified because there's sort of no background that could give us grounds for that kind of evaluation. On the other hand, on a Lockean view, or more generally a traditional liberal view, the point of having a, a government is to create the conditions under which every individual within the society can pursue the kind of life that she seems that she thinks is most worthwhile for herself. So the idea is that everybody is an equal citizen and an adult and therefore they should be able to decide what kind of life they want and try to achieve it. That doesn't of course mean that the government has to guarantee that people do achieve the kind of lives that they want. It just means that, for example, the government is there to keep other people from unjustifiably preventing you from pursuing what you think is good by, for example, killing you. A government would have to prohibit murder because to fail to do so would privilege one group of citizens, namely the murderers, and their desired form of life, murdering, over the other group, the non-murdered murderers who end up not being able to live their lives because they are murder victims. So this means that the fundamental value governing legitimate government action is the preservation and promotion of individual citizens' liberty. And that's where the criminal law comes into tension with this fundamental guiding value behind a liberal democracy. So this makes our question very straightforward. Given that criminal law is all about punishment, and punishment is all about infringing on or taking away people's liberty, and that in a liberal democracy, taking away liberty requires a special moral justification. It follows that criminal laws require a special kind of moral justification. Other kinds of laws, which are not essentially involved with taking away people's liberty, will require their own kinds of justifications, but they don't require the same kind of special justification uh, the special, same kind of special justification, or at least across the board, they don't require the same special kind of justification. So here's a way of getting the hang of how this has actual practical importance. The United States has a huge number of laws and a lot of them to a lot of people seem pretty silly So obviously what we need 
is a way of determining whether or not these laws are justified, whether or not the reasons for the considerations in favor of making the laws are the kind that can overcome the presumption of liberty. The way we can do that is by using liberty limiting principles. A lot of time when we're discussing topics like whether or not a law is justified, people give answers that are not of the right kind. That is, they give reasons that are not covered by a legitimate liberty limiting principle. One example of this is when people give what we can call legalist rational, rationales for laws. And basically, that's just saying that um, a law is justified because it's in fact a law. So it would be like somebody saying, why should we prohibit people from stealing? And somebody giving the answer, well, we should prohibit them from stealing because theft is a crime. Well, that doesn't answer the question, right? Because what we want to know is why should it be a crime, or at least whether it should be a crime. And so legalist rationales can't be the right kind of answer. Bonus question. Figure out how this fits in with our discussions earlier of begging the question. For our purposes, I'm just going to assume that consequentialism can't give us a legitimate liberty limiting principle. A consequentialist would just approach the problem by saying that the criminal laws are justified whenever they create the greatest amount of good overall. And that makes criminal law just like any other governmental policy. It doesn't seem to leave much room for the very special kind of justification we're asking for here. Now, I don't want to pretend that this is any objection to consequentialism or that there's not plenty of stuff to be said. It's just that to keep things relatively simple, or at least as simple as they can get, I'm going to set aside this set of considerations. Thus, we can talk about reasons as potentially being good reasons for making criminal laws when they are covered by one of the following principles. So for example, the fact that in murdering people, one harms them, gives us a good reason under the harm principle. We'll talk more about all of these principles later. And here they are in a more simplified form. Finally, one quick point that is worth mentioning, but we're going to ignore after this. What we're giving here is just an assessment of whether or not a certain reason is a good reason for making a law. It doesn't follow from the fact that there's a good reason in the sense of a legitimate reason to make a law that we have to make that law or that that law is the best of all possible laws to make. It just means that there is a good argument in favor of it. But there could be arguments that trump that argument or trump those reasons and thus give us a reason uh, overall. And thus overall we have the we have most reason not to make the law. But this is just a complication that we can ignore. For the rest of this, we're going to pretend as though having a good reason to make the law is enough for making the law.